Hi everyone, artist series at a distance. I love doing these interviews. I get the chance to connect with so many great, great musicians and talk about their story. And it never ceases to amaze me the interesting turns that everybody's career has taken and continues to take. So would you please welcome today, Mr. Eric Bloom. Hey, how you doing out there in Cyberland? <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for joining me. You know, singer, songwriter, musician, best known as the co-lead vocalist, and guitar and keyboard synthesizer player for Blue Oyster Cult. On more than 20 albums, you really, really have got some great history of what you have done with this band and in the music industry. Thanks so much. You know, being a Long Island guy myself, you know, I know your history. Very glad to uh, do this uh, video with you. Thank you so much, Eric. You know, well, there have been many, many drummers that have played in Blue Oyster Cult that I know very, very well. And it's just amazing to see the connection of what you guys are continuing to do. It's absolutely incredible. Well, you know, Buck Dharma, he was uh, born in uh, Merrick and uh, grew up in St. James. Our current drummer these days, Jules Rodino, you know, he lives uh, out east in Long Island. We're very glad to have been from there and still are. It's an amazing story, Eric. It really, really is. And I had the chance to interview Buck Dharma just recently. So we'll have his interview too. So between these back-to-back -back interviews, it's really some great history into Blue Oyster Cult. But I want well, to go one, one thing before you get started. I think this is very interesting because I've watched some of these sessions. And I think it's a great thing, you know, to get some of these people down for posterity. But I have to draw sort of an analogy to getting to Blue Oyster Cult after getting to like Steve Gadd, Trick Korea, Steve Lukather, and I, I think this is great because this reminds me of the uh, Tonight Show with Johnny Carson when he had on um, Frank Sinatra, uh, Bob Hope, and George Goble, which is a very famous episode where George Goble is sitting in the hot chair between those guys, and George Goble says the following. He says, I feel like a pair of brown shoes. And everybody cracks up and Carson's losing it. He's like spitting up his water. <laughs> and uh, because George Goble is a very famous guy, but compared to the other guys, he was, it felt like he was a pair of brown shoes. <laughs> so, uh, well, every, chance, uh, um, every chance that uh, when he was looking away, if you watch that show, because you can watch anything on the net these days, Bob Hope kept putting a cigarette out in George Goble's drink. <laughs> because they're having real drinks, you can tell. They're bomb. I sort of feel like a pair of brown shoes compared to all the rest of the people you have on the sessions. <laughs> a pair of brown shoes, for sure you are not, because what you have contributed with this band and what you have done is just absolutely historic. And I want to kind of go back to the beginning of what got you involved when you first bought your first guitar, which was a $52 Harmony full-bodied electric guitar. <laughs> when did that happen? Probably about 1960 or something like that. You know, I watched, you know, like I said, some of these other things where you have these encouraging families, you know, their, their parents were musicians and they encouraged their children at age three to <laughs> hold a drumstick or to uh, get a little piano. You know, there was none of that in my family. When I wanted to get a guitar, it was um, not in exactly encouraged and everybody was ready to kill me. I, I persevered. And, you know, within a year or two, that neck on that guitar was like this. <laughs> so luckily, I, I was able to sell that guitar, um, like I think my freshman or sophomore year of college. So was that was that a sign of the times around the 60s, as, as, as I remember, you know, in those days, there was so much great music, there was so much happening, there were bands that were going on, the Beatles, the British Invasion, so much was happening at that time. Well, you know, this is a little before that, you know, uh, my musical influ influences, you know, back then was just pre-Beatles, you know, just 58, 59, you know, listening to AM radio in New York City, you know, Alan Freed, uh, the big DJs of the day, the WMCA good guys on AM radio, sort of late R&B, you know, the doo-wop bands. And then sort of there was like a little gap there between, uh, let's say, the Olympics, you know, and bands like that. And and then the British invasion, it was like about a two or three year period where um, you had your Roy Orbison's and your Gene Pitney's yeah. and your Del Shannon's and bands like that. And I was really into that stuff. Always wanted to be in a band and never really had a chance. Fell in with a bunch of guys who were in bands. And I used to be the guy like I would show up with my little harmony guitar and they <laughs> would run for the hills like, you know. You know, I, I, they would say, here comes Bloom with his guitar. Let's go, like, study somewhere else, you know. 
So, because I was, I was, you know, not that serious. I just knew like three, four, five chords, you know, but I wanted, I had all the desire in the world, but I didn't have the work, work ethic. That's why I wound up being more of a front man than a musician. So what was it like you were hearing these bands play and you wanted to join the band? The band Lost and Found. Was that that was a couple of years later. I would say my junior year, I heard some guys practicing in like the lounge of a, of a, of a dorm. And I went over and I heard them practicing, told them that I had some gigs and they didn't. So I encouraged them to play my shows with me. And we'd have two singers, that freshman and me. And within a week, I had a car and I had a PA. The freshman was out. They were the lost and found. That's the name they had chosen. And um, it sort of became my band. And uh, well, it wasn't my band, but you know, I, I, I fronted that band. So you had the confidence to get up in front and sing. And what kind of tunes were you guys playing? You know, it's all covers. All covers. But, so. there, but there was one guy in that band, a guy named Peter Havlin, uh, who was writing some originals. He really was a dedicated practiced a lot and he played a Gibson ES-335 and uh, was a real character and uh, a great guy. The rest of us are like um, George Faust, who's a great player, and uh, John Trivers, who's still a friend of mine to this day, who co-wrote some Blue Oyster Cult songs with, are all still in touch. Boy, how interesting. So then, then you make a move to Plainview, Long Island, and you get a job at Sam Ash in Huntington, which was the music store on Long Island. I lived close to there and visited there all the time. You're working there. Is that kind of where you started to meet the players that eventually, you know, brought you into Blue Oyster Cult? Well, there's a little interim story where I got a job working at Premier Talent. I moved down from college, Hobart College in Geneva, New York. I moved down to take this job as an agent because I was sort of a, a local booking guy up at school and uh, did sound for bands and things like that when I the band wasn't working. So uh, I had been in touch with the, this ag agencies to uh, book other shows. So they had hired me to be a trainee at Premier Talent, which is one of the biggest agencies in New York. A big tour was coming to America, the crazy world of Arthur Brown. And they were having Brian Auger and Julie Driscoll as their opening act. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I moved to Long Island to go to work at Premier Talent. And on a Monday morning, I called them and I said, I'm back in New York City area and I'm ready to go to work. And they said, well, uh, bad news. They couldn't get their visa. That tour is fizzled and we have no place for you. I had to beat the bushes and get a job. So I walked into Hempstead, Sam Ash, and I walked into Jerry Ash's office and I had bought stuff there. And I said, you know, I gave him a good line, you know, that I need a job. He gave me a job as a trainee. So I worked on the floor for about a week and the guys from Soft White Underbelly who became Blue Oyster Cult right. walked in and I was their salesman. And if it wasn't for that chance meeting that day, you and I would not be doing this interview right now. Unbelievable. Uh, Did you hang a picture of, of one of your old photos on the wall at Sam Ash? Correct. One of the guys in the band, Rick, I had taken, you know, their pictures on the wall of all music stores of bands who had bought gear. Yeah. So there was pictures of the Rolling Stones and the Who and whatever. I took a lost and found eight by 10 and put it on the wall when no one was looking. <laughs> so the bass player from Soft White Underbelly, the precursor to Blue Oyster Cult, and uh, noticed the picture on the wall. And he said, oh, I know that band, you know. And, and I said, how do you know that band? Because that's me in the picture. He goes, what do you mean that's you in the picture? I said, that's me, right? Me. Look at the picture. That's me. So we started making small talk. The singer from the band was a guy named Les Bronstein. Les Bronstein and I had gone to college together. Another one of those happenstances. Yeah. Les called me Thanksgiving Day of 68 and said the band was playing the Electric Circus, which was upstairs from the Dom on uh, St. Mark's Place. And he said, the sound was not good there. Could I bring my PA down to do the sound for them Thanksgiving Day of 68? So I did. I got my van got my PA, I drove down there and did the sound for them. The band guys and I hit it off and they asked me, would you like to move into the band house and work for the band? So I said, I think they asked me because I had a van and a PA. Christmas day of 68, I moved into the band house and went to work for the band as a quote unquote tour manager. There was no tour, but they needed somebody to work for them as an interim between management of the band. 
April of 69, the band had a falling out with Les, the singer. And uh, Alan Lanier had heard some tapes of me from Lost and Found on a trip to upstate New York that Alan and I took. And he told the guys in the band he heard my voice on tape and he thought I ought to get a shot. And they made me the singer of the band. So at, at that time, you're working sound. So did you have experience mixing a band or miking up a band? Was that You a know, back in those days, it wasn't rocket science. You know, you had a, a, an amp and you had maybe a little four pot mixer with a little, you know, treble and bass. <laughs> and you did the sound, you know, and you had four mics, you know, or five mics. It, it, it wasn't like it is today where you need to, you know, a degree. Yeah. Um, so I'd done sound for um, Iron Butterfly and Richie Havens. You know, you know, uh, Allen Ginsberg did a sp- speaking gig. I did his sound. And with Lawrence Ferling- Ferlinghetti was there, who uh, RIP just recently. And um, so I'd done some sound, but I mean, I wasn't a sound man per se, but, you know, I'd done some sound gigs. You know, back then a sound system... You know, if it wasn't a big voice in the theater thing like like real venues had, like like Fillmore East, I had columns, you know, big columns. I had a Bogan 100 amp. I had a a, a, a tape delay, uh, and and I had some mics and mic stands. You had what it took in that process. So, in 1971, <laughs> they settle on the name Blue Oyster Cult. The first album. Well, we did we did an audition for Clive Davis. I'm sure you're familiar with Black Rock, where Columbia Records used to be. Uh-huh. 53rd Street and 6th Avenue. The 12th floor there was where all the record executives were. And a guy named Murray Krugman was our point man to get us a deal at Columbia Records. So uh, he arranged for us to do an audition for Clive on the 12th floor, I believe it was. They, cl- they cleared out a meeting room and we had to play in a meeting room, not, not at a club where most bands would play at a club and the executives <laughs> would come down and watch. He didn't want to do that. So Clive wanted to hear us play in a meeting room at Black Rock. So they cleared out a meeting room with fluorescent lighting, (laughs) a long rectangular room, you know, a rectangle room, (laughs) you know. So they turned off half the lights in the room and we played on the short side of the rectangle, like over here. And sitting over here was about 10 chairs facing this way. And Clive Davis sat in one of the chairs Harry Nilsson, may he rest in peace, happened to be in the building, so they asked him to sit in. Bobby Columbi, who you probably know. Very, very good drummer. Was, blood, sweat, and tears, yeah. Right. He was in the building, so he sat in on the session. And Patti Smith was dating Alan Lanier, our keyboard player at the time. Incredible. And she was there, along with a couple of other a r people. Maybe there was eight or nine people sitting over here while we were playing for, facing this way. <laughs> So we did a five song set in this meeting room. Three songs into the five song set, Nilsson gets up and leaves the room. So I'm standing there singing and Nilsson gets up and leaves in the middle of a song. I think <laughs> we must suck. <laughs> so I said, well, that's the end of our recording career. you know." <laughs> so about the fifth song, he comes back in and sits down. So I go, what is that about? So after the fifth song, everybody gets up Sandy Perlman was also there, and he goes out with Clive. Ten minutes later, he comes back in, and he says, Clive likes you. They're going to sign you. You know, we got a deal. So everyone was milling around. I went over to Harry Nilsson, shook his hand, glad to meet him, loved his music. And I said, Harry, do you mind me asking you, why did you get up and leave and then come back? He said, I had to have a cigarette. (laughs) True story. And I think people should know that, you know, Sandy Perlman, who was the manager of the band at that time. Yes. And our mentor. And he was like everything to us. Yeah. He wrote uh, a lot of our early lyrics. He put us on the map. He gave us direction. So what was happening with the band at this time? Who was who was doing the writing? How was this all formulating for the band? Well, you know, a long, long story. You know, I mean, the band existed before I got there. So all the early writing was really being done kind of ensemble, but uh, Albert Bouchard, our drummer, was doing a lot of writing. Uh, Donald Roser, who changed his name to Buck Dharma. Uh, Sandy Perlman had sort of a vision for how the band should be and what it should be and the direction the band should go in. 
there, there was like a manila envelope with lyrics in it that anyone could grab anything out of it and try to write a song with it. And M Richard Meltzer had songs in there. Richard was a writer, a rock critic and a writer. Sandy Perlman was one of the editors of Cordati Magazine, which was one of the early rock magazines. So he had lyrics that he would put in there and anybody could write your own stuff or look through lyrics that were in that envelope. So it wasn't until maybe a couple of years later till I said, maybe I should try to write something. We would rehearse in like a living room or a basement or whatever band house we had. So sometimes songs were like half done and I would sort of like make a melody fit a track. And uh, the way we worked our songwriting, uh, um, if you wrote the melody, you get a songwriting credit. Mm -hmm. So uh, songs later on, maybe second, third album, um, I was uh, creating melodies to tracks and a song like uh, Flaming Telepaths on our third album. Yeah. Um, that's how I get a songwriting credit. But it wasn't until years later that I was actually writing songs from scratch. And I mean, Don't Fear the Reaper, I remember that. That was just like incredible. How well, you know, that's a solo written by Buck Dharma. Uh, real name is Don Roser. Mm -hmm. And uh, that certainly, you know, the first album sold three, 400,000 copies. Mm -hmm. So we were really, Cream Magazine picked us as that as album of the year and new band of the year. So uh, we were opening for Alice Cooper. On the uh, opening for Alice, we got to play in front of a lot of people. And the first album broke off of that. And then while we were on tour, we had to hurry up and make a second album because the first album was doing something. So we actually started writing in hotel rooms. We had to like rush right home and make another fast album. So that's the second album was called Tyranny Mutation. Everything was like an album a year and then go out and tour because the only money we had was money we made from touring. Mm -hmm. And we had a, an advance from Columbia Records. So it was all hurry up, hurry up all the time. The first four years were really, really um, write the songs, record the songs, tour the songs with no break. So it was pretty intense the way this was all going down. I mean, so, you know, you're all kind of like a family now traveling. You're, for the most part, living together, writing and rehearsing. This yeah, we had, band, we had band houses. Our first band house was in Great Neck. And that's the band house I moved into Christmas of 68. And we were there maybe one, one and a half more years. Then we got a band house in Dix Hills on Vanderbilt Parkway. Uh -huh. And um, then we got another band house in Eaton's Neck after that, which is by Northport. I think that was our last band house because we started getting a little bit more successful and everybody in the band started getting their own place. By 1976, with the, the success of Don't Fear the Reaper, et cetera, everybody was started getting their own places. So what was happening now from a business side as far as publishing or how the band was, were you guys equal partners? You know, the business side is such an important part. And that's a lot of degree of what we try to focus here because the music industry, you've got to understand that business side to have some kind of success to manage it. The band made a deal with, with each other that all the publishing would be um, together, be occult songs. And uh, that lasted for many, many, many years. That would be all the original members uh, and it included Sandy Perlman and Richard Meltzer, Be Occult right. Songs. And uh, that only stopped maybe 20 years ago hmm. or so. But you got to remember, oh, many, you know, 1981, Albert left the band. 1985, Joe Bouchard quit the band. Right. So, you know, there was many, many th different things happened over the years. Boy, I want to talk about the fact that you, you're an avid reader, especially in science fiction and fantasy novels. Yes, how did that affect your writing, both in, in lyrics and then future projects? You know, there's a lot of that all through our lyrics. You know, not just me. You know, I, I know uh, Buck is much more into horror. It's more of a Stephen King fan type type of stuff. Yeah. Or Peter Straub, you know, those, those kind of books. Yeah. And I'm more into uh, hard sci-fi and fantasy than he is. I'm much more into, um, you know, spaceships and ray guns and stuff like that than he is. And he's much more into creepy stuff. I wrote a song called Take Me Away, which is uh, I wrote with Aldo Nova. I wrote the lyric. He wrote the music. It's a kind of uh, autobiographical. It's about, I mean, you can listen to the song, you know, those of you out there listening. It's about, uh, you know, here I am at the speed of sound. This song is going out, out there. And if they're listening, here I am. Come get me. You know, during this pandemic, uh, people have been kind of like just, you know, not doing anything as far as performing. 
is there anything you're doing in this time that's allowing you to create or continue to read and write and open up a whole nother area of thought process? Well, last year in 2020, uh, we put out a new album about uh, October of 2020, which was actually finished about April of 2020. We started it in late 19 before the pandemic. And we actually rehearsed in before the pandemic. We we're writing before the pandemic. And then when it hit, we started finishing it like the way we're doing this interview now uh, via Zoom yeah. uh, or in different kinds of uh, Zoom-like uh, sessions. Matter of fact, I'm sitting in a room here uh, where I did all my vocals and uh, guitar and keyboard parts here in this room. It's uh, very, very different. And, and, you know, I was talking to Alice Cooper um, a couple of months ago, and he said everybody he knows is doing sessions, you know, via long distance. A, a lot of people are, are taking this time to be creative because you can, because they can't tour. Tell me about collaborating with uh, Eric Van Lusbader. I wrote a song that was rejected <laughs> for a movie. When that song got rejected by a movie, we said, well, you know, the music's good. Let's use it for something else. We had a tentative title for this album. It was called Club Ninja. So I said, well, I just read this book, The Ninja by Eric Van Lusbader. And I said, maybe I could try and contact him to write some lyrics for us. So how do you contact him? You know, so I had written some uh, books with um, Michael Moorcock, who's a fantasy writer. I just contacted him through his publisher. So I said, let's try that. I actually reached him. And guess what? He lives in Southampton. <laughs> so so um, well, for you listeners, um, he, that's Long Island. So um, a very successful book called The Ninja and a follow-up book called The Miko. Yeah. And uh, I think both books were sold to make movies out of more than once. So it was great for him because he got two great advances. I drove out to his house and uh, he had a car in the driveway and the license plate was The Ninja. So I said, this, maybe this is going to be cool. So uh, I played him the track and that became uh, a song called Shadow Warrior. Maybe not the best Blue Oyster Cult song of all time, but it was a collaboration between uh, Buck and myself and Eric Van Lusbader. It's, it's really amazing to see how, how creativity can reach certain areas, but there has to be the, the confidence and the perseverance and the courage to reach out to these people and give it a shot. You did that. Well, yeah, like with, uh, with uh, Michael Moorcock, who's like, uh, I loved his books yeah. and I wanted to contact him. So I, I said, what the hell? So I wrote a fanboy letter to his publisher. I said, please forward this to him. And I told him who I was, and they did. So he wrote me, uh, this is before the internet, he wrote me a snail mail letter back saying, I know who you are. He says, I wrote lyrics for Hawkwind. And he said, um, let's get together. I'm in London, but I'm coming to New York. And we had lunch. And he started sending me lyrics in the mail. <laughs> so I wrote three songs with him. And, and a couple of them are some of our more well-known songs, um, and one of which was in the heavy metal, the animated film. So um, some of our fans, you know, really liked these songs that I wrote with him. It was a terrific uh, collaboration. Well, this really is a message to this younger generation that's out there that want to go out there and, and create. And there really is an incredible path that you've opened up that, that basically says, trust yourself, trust your instinct, and go for it. Yeah, why not? The, the worst that can ever happen is somebody's going to say no. I mean, so what? You know, you never know what can happen. Tell me about Career of Evil with J.K. Rowling. Oh, yeah, that, that was a great happenstance. It turns out J.K. Rowling is a fan of Blue Oyster Cult. So uh, she contacted our management or had her people contact our people. I don't know. She lifted the phone, but uh, she wanted to write. Um, she was writing these series of books under the name of Robert Galbraith as a pseudonym and has written a ser these series of books. The third book in the series is called Career of Evil, which is one of our songs, which is a lyric actually by Patti Smith. J.K. Rowling, being a Blue Oyster Cult fan, wanted to write a book based on Blue Oyster Cult lyrics and using that as a theme for one of her murder mysteries under the name Robert Galbraith. So if you read the book, it's Blue Oyster Cult themed all the way through it. It's about a murderer who quotes Blue Oyster Cult or has Blue Oyster Cult tattooed. You know, a very interesting story. 
And uh, each chapter starts with a Blue Oyster Cult lyric quote in every chapter. What an incredible honor and compliment for having a fan of that caliber. Did yeah, and yet we've invited her to every time we go to the UK and she never comes. It might be difficult at that level of what she's been doing to get out there. And <laughs> yeah, I imagine she'd, she'd have to wear a wig and a big wart on her nose or something to, <laughs> to go outside. <laughs> you know, it's amazing, Eric, as I do these interviews and I have a chance of being able to, to open up these stories. And are, are there disciplines that you feel you had that that helped you along the way? Are you a disciplined person? Are you an organized person? How did all of this happen? Well, a lot of what I would call fate, hmm. you know, that put me sitting here talking to you today. I'm not saying that I absolutely believe in my stars or whatever, whatever you want to call it. But it's certainly um, a lot of odd things happened to me over the years that uh, guided me along a certain path. But uh, sometimes you make your own. So it's hard to say that's, that's what it is. You know, I always liked music, always followed music, always wanted to be in music. I got very lucky, you know, uh, along the way. And um, every time um, things looked down, something came along to pull us back up. And yeah, there's a lot of hard work along the way too. You know, I mean, Blue Oyster Cult has, you know, gone up, it's been down, it's been up, it's been down, you know, and yet here we are 50 years later and uh, we're playing some of the biggest gigs we've ever played. And it, it's like a wonderful thing. Of course, we can't play at all right now, but, um, or, or very little, let's put it that way. But that's, you know, the COVID thing. And that's, you know, with everybody. Well, you say the, power of luck. I think there was an incredible amount of hard work and dedication and really many, many hours of staying focused on the intention of what you all wanted to achieve. That was also a part of that mix, which is a very, very powerful combination. And chemistry too. You know, I mean, uh, putting the original five in a room, you know, and the chemistry of each guy playing off each other and they're, they're, you know, everybody's strengths and weaknesses. You know, I have to give, you know, 999.9% uh, to Buck Dharma, you know? He wrote those songs. You know, I give him a lot of credit. It's fantastic because the span of time has proven the value of what he's written and what you have written and what the band has done. It has proven its worth 10 times over because you're still going stronger than ever. And that to me is really what's amazing about the, the collaboration of the chemistry that was put together. Well, also, you know, we're known as a live band, you know, and, and uh, the live show is, uh, you know, everybody, whoever's in the band at that time, you know, puts on a good live show. You know, it's a collaborative effort. And, um, you know, every guy in the band, you know, pulls his weight. You know, I've got to ask you, Eric, you know, we've got these people that listen to this and these fans of Blue Oyster Cult and fans of yours. And it's amazing to see how they, they listen to it and they hang on to every word that you're saying. So in closing, I want you to give some advice to this generation that will be listening to this in years and years to come. What can you tell them about how they can kind of really, you know, follow their love of their passion to succeed? And how can they have that feeling of, I can do this? What would you say to them? You know, stick with it, you know, and, and maybe you got to get a day job, you know, or, or something to pay the bills, but just stick with it when you're not doing that, you know, and um, if you fancy yourself as a writer, keep writing. If you fancy yourself as a player, keep playing. Look at Stephanie, Lady Gaga, you know, she played every juke joint in Brooklyn, you know, and, and uh, I, I have a feeling that she always saw herself where she is today before she, you know, started doing what she's doing. Yeah. And you have to have a vision and you have to love getting excited about it all too. I walked on the stage, maybe my second gig ever. I walked on the stage of Fillmore East on July 3rd, 1969. You know, it's that excitement that, that you can actually achieve that, you know, and, and that excites you to move to the next step. It all depends, you know, like I'm in a band, so everybody has to uh, help the next guy, you know, uh, achieve what they want. So um, I think Blue Oyster Cult was lucky in that, you know, everybody helped each other out. And um, I, I was sort of at the beginning, sort of along for the ride because I wasn't hired 
to uh, at the beginning. I, I was hired, you know, sort of late early, and I wasn't hired to like write songs and and uh, be part of the uh, early creative mix. That sort of came along a little later, but uh, everybody was behind me, um, you know, to front the band when um, it was very very early, and everybody gave me their confidence. So you know that was good, and um, you know it, it worked out. So. I suggest everybody out there, you know, sounds trite, follow your star. Well, I mean, that really is powerful advice. And you have done that and you continue to do that. So the proof is really kind of in the action. Follow and, me. And, and, and believe me, like I said before, there's been plenty of ups and downs. You know, like um, in the late 80s or mid 80s, um, you know, a, like somebody told me, yeah, the gravity sets in. And that happens for everybody. You know, like watching that uh, BG special that was on, uh, I think, CNN or something recently. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic special. I highly, uh, everybody should watch that. It's just such, such a wonderful, uh, that all those brothers and uh, what they did and all their ups and downs. And uh, I really related to that. And um, they, um, such wonderful music and how it all came about. It's never, it's never like straight up all the time, no matter who you talk to. And uh, you just got to roll with it. And just, um, you never know when uh, something good's going to come along. Well, one of the most positive cults I've ever enjoyed listening to has been Blue Oyster Cult. So I must say that the message that you've sent out is so positive. It's continuing and it's influencing millions and millions of people. Well, you know, we've enjoyed this ride. You know, um, all the ups and all the downs, it's all been a generally uh, a fantastic ride. You know, for Buck and myself, I know... Uh, a lot of people ask, you know, what's, what is our chemistry? He's one of the world's great guitar players. And, you know, I just do the we're not worthy, you know, to, you know, his greatest strength. You know, we wrote those songs and he's a great guitar player. And he knows that, um, you know, what I do best. And he gives me full reign to do all the stuff I do. I write the set lists, I front the band and, and um, run the show. And um, it's, we, you know, I can't think. In 50 years, we've ever had an argument, you know, about music of any kind. And, and it's, it's just been a great ride. An absolutely beautiful message. And I want everyone to really understand that, that it can work out, you know, in these happy endings of being able to be in a band and work together. The ultimate comes down is the respect you guys have for each other, which to me is absolutely beautiful. And for that, I thank you so much. Eric Bloom, Artist Series at a Distance. Fantastic to meet you. You have done great. I look forward at some point to meeting you again in person. Uh, well, I'll be back on the island and then uh, you know, we'll break bread. I love that thought. Thank you so much, Eric. Safe travels. Hey, and uh, let's go Mets. <laughs> Dom Famular here, the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.